Hey everyone, my name is Josh Proctor and this is the Life on Side B podcast. On this podcast, we are going to discuss, as the name pretty much clearly states, what life as Side B LGBT Christians is really like. For those of you who don't know, Side B is a term used to refer to Christians who are LGBT, attracted to the same sex, or have gender dysphoria, yet hold a traditional view of sexuality and marriage, and therefore live according to that view. Every episode, I will be talking with different Side B Christians about different aspects of their life, faith, and experiences. My goal with this podcast is to show that being side B is not this depressing life of self-hatred and loneliness, but rather, it can be pretty dang beautiful and amazing. Now, every season, we will be focusing on a different theme of sexuality and faith issues related to the lives of side B Christians. This season, though, I am really excited because we are going to be looking at different ways side B Christians live out their sexuality and find intimacy and community. Each of these interviews has been a huge encouragement, even for me, as I navigate what community and belonging look like in my own life. You will be able to see that there are so many different ways that side B Christians can live with joy within their faith. And in that way, I hope it can be an encouragement for you too. So with that, let's head into today's episode. So today we are finishing the conversation with David Gill about the book Costly Obedience. Last week we went over the first two chapters And now we're going to finish the rest of the book. And so this has been a really great conversation. If you haven't listened to last week's episode, I would definitely recommend going and listening to that first. So with that, we'll head into the conversation. So moving on a little bit. Um, because we got to keep going, um, or else this thing's going to be like four hours long. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, w- I would say the one going into kind of chapter three, one of the biggest things that yeah. uh, this was one of the areas where I wish you had more clarity was he talked about who was in this, uh, included in his study. And he talked about that. There's people who are in mixed orientation marriages. There's people who are called to celibacy. And then he talked about a third group of people who are celibate, but open to mixed orientation marriage. And it was quite a number of people. And um, I'm trying to find it even now, but, oh, he says, however, they, um, they indicate that they are open to a relationship with the opposite sex uh, as contrasted with those who do not see such a relationship as an option. And I kind of wish... I could have seen the question that was asked because Mm. I'm like, for instance, for me, if the question is, would you get married if you found someone who was um, attractive? Duh. Mm. Like, I think the issue is I don't, I I know my sexuality. I am a Kinsey six and Mm -hmm. I've never found a woman attractive. So that's why it's not an option. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that most people would be open to it. If not, I I just kind of would have loved some more clarity on what it meant to like Mm -hmm. open to a relationship with the opposite sex. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And my own experience is one that like, I, I have found women attractive before very few of them, maybe two, maybe three mm -hmm. my whole life, which means I'm averaging about one every 12 years right now (laughs) of my life. Um, You know, so, which is fine, but like, and I would still pretty much categorize myself as a Kinsey six, uh, despite that. But like, I, hmm, I, I wonder about that, the identity of that group and like what they tend to believe about fulfillment. And if they can, if they're, because if a person who isn't attracted to women at all as a general rule, but who doesn't see themselves for whatever reason, thriving as an unmarried person, they're going to probably answer that question, whatever it was, as, 
yeah, I'm open to this because mm-hmm. their fear of being single creates this environment where they're willing to step out and do something that they probably otherwise wouldn't. Yeah. Um, but there are other people that I've met who are like, yeah, like this is, you know, this is where I'm at on the Kinsey scale and I found this lady and I really like her and I'm going to get married. And obviously I'm talking about dudes at this point. Yeah. Um, Cause that's the, that's the tribe to which I belong is the dude tribe. Um, but I just, it, it makes me and also like people who are going to be like, yep, no, I'm in this for, I'm, I'm celibate and single for life. Like maybe they're more like me. Maybe they're in their upper thirties. Maybe, maybe they aren't. Maybe they're, optimistic 22 year olds. I don't know. Like there's just so many different scenarios I can envision that I don't know where those lines would even begin to be drawn. Does that make sense? Oh no, absolutely. And even kind of what you're talking about with a celibate person who just can't imagine themselves single. I I am fascinated by this when he asked um, people, can people like, do Mm. you agree with the statement or not? Persons can live sexually celibate while they have same sex attractions. And that's a 99% of people indicated that they agreed with the statement. Shocker. Um, It said three people disagreed with this statement, one from each of the three groups, which means two celibate people don't believe you can live celibate with same sex attractions. Um, That fascinates me. I want to get into these people's brains. Sure. Okay. So then you've got people who maybe interpret language hyper literally, right? Maybe. So, so if their standard for celibacy is perfection, yeah. then sure, they're going to answer no, because their conviction is that unless I'm doing this perfectly, I'm not actually being celibate. Now, are they technically, are they technically correct? Under certain circumstances, I'd say yes. Yeah. I don't, I didn't, I didn't get the sense that that's what the question's really asking. The uh-huh. question, like these are these are generally what is the general direction of your life kinds of questions, not yeah. are you able to keep in your pants 365 days a year, 24 hours a day? And I just, I, I don't know. It would be interesting to find out what theological tradition those three people were from. Yeah. Because I don't envision an evangelical saying that unless they were super super conservative does that make sense yeah so like, i mean hey if you are one of those three people out there and you're listening contact me i would love to talk to you yeah um that would be a fascinating conversation i guess just because i could totally see i could totally see a person in mixed orientation marriage saying that obviously and i oh, guess yeah. i could maybe see a person who is celibate but open to a mixed orientation you right. know mixed orientation marriage saying that yeah. that makes sense but then one of those people is a person who doesn't see that as an option for them. Right. And so still it's says, interesting. Yeah. And still says, no, this is impossible. And it's like, well, yeah. Uh, um, then which, I question your life choices. <laughs> <laughs> which I guess I, I, I just would love. I, I remember reading that and I was like, huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, let's dig into this because that, that's interesting. Um, but then the other thing that really stuck out to me was when he just really showed related to beliefs on, on whether the attractions are sinful or just sexual intercourse is sin, sinful or whatever it was. And I, I thought it was also interesting that he showed that the biggest difference was between people who are celibate and in mixed orientation marriage. And I think that a lot of that, um, you know, from the people that I know that are mixed orientation marriage, there's like really two groups of people. There's people who were side B, openly gay, and then later on they got married. Right. And then you have the people who came from more of an ex-gay background. They got married from an ex-gay perspective, like this is going to make me straight or I'm just going to do this because I'm going to force it to work. Or they didn't, maybe didn't come out until after getting married. And then after getting married, kind of and came more came to us. Yeah, yeah. Came out and came to a side B stance and, and they're just, they're still married. And so I can imagine that second group really landing more conservative on attractions and, you know, the possibility of yes. your attractions changing and all of that. Um, but it's interesting then again, to see like this, this, I didn't want to say divide, but diversity of perspective yeah. in, yes. in the community. So. Yeah, I, I think I think this does like bring attention to some uh, some distinctions within the community in terms of opinion. I it's something that I've always wanted to ask. So so of those who would say 
who are in a mixed orientation marriage, um, I, the sense I have from the few conversations I've had is that usually same-sex attraction is treated very suspiciously. Yeah. Right. Like nothing good. I hear this. I hear this somewhat frequently from from that sort of person is the statement that well nothing good comes from that and I go hold the phone hold the phone mm-hmm. like I would love to ask those folks like is there really no way in which a same-sex attraction might lead to a positive outcome yeah like Wesley Hill in his book spiritual friendship um, talks about how without his attractions to the same gender uh, he probably wouldn't spend money in the way that he does. He probably wouldn't, you know, invest in the relationships that he does. He probably yeah. wouldn't relate to the same people or like the same art or or anything like that. Like it all kind of ties together. And so like he's listing his same sex attractions as an asset rather than a liability. And I think that mm-hmm. we sort of brainwash married people in the church to see anything that kind of falls outside of the norm, whatever the norm happens to be as a quote threat to your marriage, close quote. Mm-hmm. And so obviously if a same sex, attra- if, 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 if finding another dude attractive feels like a threat to the vows you've made, you're going to think it's a, you're going to think it's always a negative. You're always going to see it as a liability. Yeah. And I don't think it has to be seen that way. Now, if you're a sex addict, it might be a liability and you might need to be like watched. Right. You know, but yeah. Like, it, otherwise, I think that, like, the way that my sexuality has interfaced with the way I make friends is I collect people. I'm a hyper extrovert. I'm about 100% extroverted on the MBTI. Like, there's just not a shy bone in my body. And not that introverts are shy. Don't send letters to Josh. I know the difference. Okay. So, but, like, I, I use those. I see somebody. I'm like, ooh, they're attractive. Let me make friends with them. And I've made really, really good lasting friendships that way. And that makes some, that makes some people very uncomfortable when I say that. But the thing is, is like, it's exactly the same point Wesley Hill is making in his book, Spiritual Friendship. I'm just a little cruder when I say it. Mm-hmm. It's not that I look at somebody and I start lusting after them and then I sanctify those desires. It's an attraction. It's not lust. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's, we always put sexual orientation as who you want to have sex with. But I think that there's something so much more yes. deeper about it. And I think that that's where you get to the part of like, could this be the good part of our attractions? Uh, right. That like, I'm drawn to more relationships with men and more oh. intimacy with men. Um, yeah. I have great female friends mm-hmm. and I cherish those as some of the most important uh, relationships in my life. But when I am looking for intimacy, I am drawn to men. Mm -hmm. And that's not just about sex. That's about friendships. That's about who I, who I uh, want to, you know, go do things with, you know, I, I like, I like how you said Wesley Hill put it, like it changes the way I, I spend my money, the way I spend my time, the friendships I invest in the church I'm going to go to. And honestly, I would even put, I I think we, I talked about this with uh, Meredith in a previous episode of, I sometimes even wonder if if I wasn't gay, would I even be Christian? Because mm-hmm. I think my attractions even are what have led me to really um, to really evaluate my beliefs more than mm-hmm. I feel I would have if I was straight. And again, I'm not saying that I wouldn't be a Christian if I was no. straight. I'm just saying is that I don't know. It would definitely look different for sure. It would look so different. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I, I totally, uh, I think that that's very key. And I think it shows again, just the diversity of how a lot of the people in our community arrive to our community, mm-hmm. because you do mm-hmm. have some that came out of the ex gay world and realized, okay, this didn't work. Conversion therapy mm-hmm. doesn't work. Trying to change doesn't work. So they land on side B. And you have other people who were side A and were like, okay, this isn't for me. This does not work for me. And then come side B. And you have other people who just were in neither and then came side B as well. And so, and everyone is going to bring 
their mm-hmm. experiences with them. And it's, it's going to create a diversity of perspective. It's going to create a diversity of how we live out our lives. Uh, but it doesn't make us any more or less of a community. I think the other part in this chapter of experiences elevating Christians that I was actually very glad to see was that um, the mental health, at least from the way I read it was of celibate gay Christians was really like normal for like the normal general population. Um, And because I was even having a discussion with a friend of mine who's gay and a psychologist. And when I, we were talking about me being celibate, and he had mentioned that, oh, I, I would love to see, like, the mental health of celibate gay Christians. And then I read, cost, like, Costly Beyond. So I was like, hey, here's the information here's you the want. Chapter. Right. Here's <laughs> Go ahead said. and check it out. Yep. Um, but that was very glad. I was very glad to see that um, yeah. because I was, I was interested to see how celibate gay Christians would relate to that. And I don't think it would even deal as much with... I was even prepared in this chapter to see depression and issues um, being higher, but I didn't even think that if they were higher, I was interested for him to see if they connected more to being celibate or to a lack of community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I think, because even then he says later on, he does a study of well being, and it says that um, uh, it said that the three main areas where people said that they were the lowest gosh i'm I'm not gonna find it. it was but it was like it was like purpose in life self-acceptance but then it was like feeling part of a community right or, or no feeling part of a community and future security and so obviously because like we've talked about already the many times you kind of feel like you're part of the gay community, but you feel like you're an outcast. And then you feel like you're part of the church, but you also feel like you don't completely fit there. So you do have a community, but nowhere do you feel like completely in community. Right. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. I so, thought for sure we were more depressed than we are. I average. thought so too. Well, I, I mean, not. Glad to, no, we're not. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. praise Jesus. Um, yeah. Because, and I'm saying that as a person who struggles with depression, like the I'm same. very willing to open up about it. I've dealt with yep. chemical imbalance depression for mm-hmm. most of my life. And um, that has been a thing for a long time. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I do see that it's there, but I'm really glad to see that it's not as big of an issue as I honestly thought it was going to be. Right. Um, moving on to the next one where he talks about milestones. So he goes into yes. the milestones of just gay people in general, as well as gay Christians. And he even talks a little bit of unique milestones of side B people. Um, thoughts. What was, what were you thinking? Mm. So I have a couple of thoughts. First of all, um, people on average go five and a half years between becoming aware of their same sex attractions and initially attributing this attraction to being gay. Yeah. Which is something straight people almost never have to experience, right? I like that guy or girl for a straight woman or man. Seems like it would be a direct line to draw and having that line so clear yes. is probably going to lower the anxiety in that group of people. Mm-hmm. Whereas you have this scenario potentially where this guy falls in love with another guy in his youth group, for example, but being gay is awful or calling yourself gay is awful. Like, and even if he's able to call himself gay immediately, which is not what the numbers bear out, but let's pretend he can, like he's still going to be likely very aware of the downfalls, the liabilities of calling oneself gay in his context. And so like, that's going to create quite a bit of anxiety, which is going to likely lead to avoidance. And then he's not going to sort out what being gay means until much later. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and it's interesting because I think, I think Christian purity culture might have something to do with the next one that kind of stood out to me. And that's straight people kiss first and fondle later. Right. 
So gay folks kiss at 22 and fondle at 18. Ah. Straight kiss at 18 and fondle at 20. Like I, something's I did not weird. Realize this. Yes. Yeah. I did not realize this when I, when I read this. Right, right. So it seems like gay Christian youth might be so indoctrinated that the first kiss should be special that they'll fool around first and kiss later. Like, which is, which is totally backwards. Like, yeah. <laughs> and kind of unsafe, right? Like you're doing things uh. in a completely reverse order. And I just, it seems like that might be an artifact of Christian purity culture, which, okay, if you're listening to this in like five years and purity culture is like not a thing anymore, which that would be amazing. Um, and what I mean is not that purity wouldn't be emphasized in a godly scriptural fashion. I'm talking about purity culture. And if you can't figure out that distinction, please look up Joshua Harris's book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Find a copy on eBay, buy it for $2 and read uh-huh. it. Because that's the sort of crazy stuff I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. So like, I, it seems like we then end up going, kissing is not the gate anymore. Like kissing's yeah. the reward. And that seems backwards to yeah. me. It's yeah. I don't know. Did, that, did any of, does any of that strike you as odd? Like, yes. I mean, it's so funny because I didn't even see that, but um, I think that um, one of the biggest things that now looking at that stands out to me is I think that that, I really like what you said that that shows the possibly the influence of purity culture, but also I think that that could show a little bit of how, because they don't disclose, like it says that gay Christians normally don't disclose to someone else about their attractions until they're 21. So that's like a, what, like an, I, apparently I can't do math, like an eight year difference um, between realizing like their confusion um, and then, disclosure and it's a three-year distance um difference in between initial attri- attribution like realizing what they're what's no they are awareness of their same sex attraction at 13 and a half years old so it's still like eight years so that's like eight years that they're dealing with this on their own like that we dealt deal with this on our own i came out very early but um even for me coming out very early i know that then when you're a gay teen you normally aren't you don't get you don't get the gay sex talk. You don't get how to deal with this no. as a gay person and how to deal with your... You see, I spent all of my teenage years trying to act 20 years older than I was. Yes. And so you end up probably making choices that because you don't have guidance. You don't have guidance of dealing how to deal with this. So then I could see you. I could see people like maybe having sexual intercourse before they're even romantically kissed when that's completely opposite of how straight people it happens with straight people. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, and I also loved that he included in here on Milestones the issues of like grappling with side A cult, um, theology, grappling with side X, and landing on side B as those are kind of like unique, um, mm-hmm. unique milestones that maybe aren't, aren't for all gay people nor all gay um christians but you know maybe those are more specifically for side b christians but i i was glad that to see him include that because i think that's a huge part i think that that's a huge thing that um is a milestone for a lot of people Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, i i know i know it's it's been a milestone for a lot of friends of mine and even for me to a certain extent Um, like I was grappling with side A stuff when I was in undergrad in like 2004, I think is when I was in that class. I was in a Paul class and we were grappling with different texts of Paul's and I was writing my paper on Romans 1, 18 through 25. And like, so I was grappling with that then, but I was grappling with it as someone who was by conviction side X. Like I'm sitting in my biblical professor's office at Missouri State University, and I'm telling him, like, I think God will change me. And he's looking at me like, hmm, because he's like United Church of Christ. Yeah. He's like looking at me like, what what fundamentalist bus did you fall off of, sir? You know, like, and and I had. I had I, I'd been dropped off by that bus. But like that didn't change the way my grappling with that didn't change 
the way I read that passage in the years since then. It's intensified my conviction of what that passage says, but I was coming at it from a very, not a very different position than I was then, but I was, I was definitely in a different place mm -hmm. than I am now. And so it's, you know, sometimes it's nice to realize that you arrived at an answer you think is correct and you didn't have to revise it later, you know? Yeah. But I, I just, I found, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, no, I, I think that it's an interesting thing about grappling with theology because I think in many times our, when you're gay and in growing up in the church, you're almost expected to become a, theo, a, a theologian and a Bible scholar by the time you're 16. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. In ways that, again, straight people aren't because we're we're then taken into the text and into the Hebrew and, and all this stuff, just trying to figure out if we can love someone and date, you know, and how we're supposed to live. And so then at 16 years old, we're going through all these things that we may not have the education for. Um, or the guidance. Or the, or the guidance. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, because we're many times just being guided by a pastor who's just saying, this is the way it is. And this is, right. you know, and um, not really helping us walk through it. Um, but and it 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 does it it makes an impact but um moving on to chapter 5 yep. there was one part that really made me sad which was he then looked to pastors of what pastors are looking for and he said he showed that there was pastors who didn't who de-emphasized the importance of training not because they didn't feel it was important but because they would rather uh refer people with same-sex attractions to someone outside the church mm -hmm. and i kind of i feel like this is such a remnant of the exodus world and the exodus impact on the culture mm -hmm. of church because it that was so much of how exodus operated mm -hmm. and i think like the the ex gay world still kind of operates more in that way of it's not about training the church of how to include LGBT people, but a matter of let's send them out so that they can get straight and then send them back and then we don't have to deal with it anymore. And then this is a mindset that is still permanent in, in many pastors today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I, I didn't know what you thought about motivation. that. Yeah. I think there can be good motivations in wanting to, send someone who has a lot of emotional things to sort through to an actual counselor who's licensed. Like, I think that something that a lot of damage can be done by someone who doesn't actually understand how to do some of that complicated work. Yeah. Yes. Trouble, very true. Right. The trouble that I have though, is when they are being sent off to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Like that's the part that irritates me because there ought to be ongoing relationship, education, understanding on the part of the pastor, which doesn't mean that all should fall on the person who went to go get counseling. Like, yeah, in a perfect well, in a perfect world, a counsel, a, a pastor would actually have enough counseling experience to like sort it out with them themselves and be a safe enough person to do that. But like in the absence of the perfect world. Um, I think that it would be, it's at least ideal for the pastor to have someone with whom he is talking about these things who is able to speak to those things without it costing them a bunch of um, emotional tokens, as it were. Like, it, yeah. I, I'm looking for a phrase. It's, it, it shouldn't have to, it shouldn't have to traumatize the congregant to have these conversations. So like in a situation where like the congregant is doing well to just hold it together in terms of the counseling session and get healthy that way, or mm. to get, you know, counsel or guidance that way, like they shouldn't have to then be responsible to try to persuade the pastor and argue them out of say an ex gay mindset. Like yes. that, that's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. I, but I think that when pastors who see sexuality primarily through the lens of sin, I think what they're missing out on is the broader pastoral question and solution. Like mm -hmm. asking things like, are, sin, are there sins which are distinct to gay Christians? Um, 
And I think there are, just like there are sins that my straight friends are prone to that I'm just not, right? Yeah. Uh, I think in terms of broader categories, though, there are a few fewer differences regarding what sorts of sin I wrestle with and what a straight Christian does. But the, if the experience is distinct to the gay subcultures to which I belong aren't factored into the solutions offered to me by the church and her leadership, the pastoral care I'm getting will not be as effective. Right? Yes. Um, I think there was a second thing that kind of stood out to me, and that is... I think one of the reasons that there's such a radical disconnect between what pastors want to see and what gay Christians within the church want there to be is that there's a lot of suspicion for pastors to ask people what they need. Like there's a lot of suspicion mm -hmm. on behalf of those pastors. The idea that pastors are the adults in the room and the congregants are children who need to be supervised is one that exists to varying degrees in the church, especially conservative ones. Yeah. And many pastors seem to think that to let gay Christians tell them what they need from a congregation is somehow akin to letting the inmates run the asylum. Mm, yeah. And that's just not helpful. That treats those adults as if they don't have a relationship with the triune God. And I'm not saying we should only determine pastoral care concerns based on what the people we're caring for say that they need, right? Yeah. There are blind spots, but just because a person has blind spots doesn't make them blind because if it did, like this would really be the case of the blind leading the blind. Instead, like we need to be able to engage with what people say that they need. And unless they give us a really good reason to believe that they're not telling us the truth on what they say they need, like we need to take some of that at face value and then reconcile it with some of the other pastoral training we've had. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What, what do you, what's been your experience with maybe any disconnect that you've seen in, in terms of what pastors want to see versus congregants? I totally agree with that because honestly, I've, I have yet to ever have a pastor ask me that. Like, what do you feel you need in the church? Mm. I've never had a pastor ask me that. Um, wow. And yeah. It, it's impactful because mm -hmm. I think kind of like we talked in the last episode with Luke, there's such an emphasis, especially in the American church that pastors are supposed to have all the answers mm -hmm. that uh, they shouldn't have to ask. They should know what's needed. They should be able to just say, Oh, this is your issue. Oh, like a doctor, here's the medicine. This is what I'm mm -hmm. going to give you that it can many times be fearful with you know, dealing with that and, and trying to figure it out. Um, so I, I totally agree. There needs to be a willingness for, um, and for pastors to hear and say, Hey, what do you need? Mm -hmm. Um, and to be able to, to listen to their congregants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think attached to that is the consistency issue, right? And your house brings this up. Um, and we should say, I don't think we've said yet, like Olya Zaporozitz, I probably butchered that, also co-authored this. So it's really both of their words. Um, it's not just Marky Arhouse, and sorry, Olya, uh, that we've not been giving you your due here in all of the names. But like consistency is huge, right? We need a consistent sexual ethic. Like, if a straight guy who's unmarried and has sex can find grace, we need grace for those who call themselves gay, whether they're having sex or not. Right. So my experience of being gay in the church was that I was doubly guilty because I liked dudes and I lusted. And that's just not the way this works. Like lust is bad, but me finding mm -hmm. gay guys attractive in as much as it doesn't lead me to sin is no more than a, no more of a problem than a man who's attracted to a woman and seeing her like attraction doesn't always lead to lust. So like, I, I don't, it, the lack of consistency, I don't understand the lack of consistency because what it does is it ends up making somebody further down into the pit than they actually are. Yes. Like if the ground is actually level at the foot of the cross, we can't expect gay people to stand in a pit at the foot of the cross. Like they, they get to stand next to us. How, how has the consistency thing played out for you in the past? Um, uh, it's varied. Sure. Um, you know, I, I definitely have had those times of being like, where there's definitely a double standard mm -hmm. of where, and I'm trying to think of examples off the top of my head. And for some reason, I'm not, I'm, they're not coming to my, my brain. Um, again, of obviously Sleep deprivation. Brain. Sleep <laughs> deprivation. Yeah. For everyone that's wondering, I was just on a nine hour bus 
from Bogota to Armenia, and I got home at 4 a.m., so my brain's kind of fuzzy. Um, But yes, so I think that I've seen it both played out beautifully and played out very badly. And I think it really comes down to kind of like what you said, where there's those times where we as gay people are put down as doubly sinful, not only for lusting, but just having attractions in and of themselves. And so a lot of times Christians will like to say, oh, well, it is no different. But it's like, well, you were treating it as if it is. Right. You are treating it as something worse because you're literally saying just the fact of being attracted is Mm -hmm. not. Because it's kind of like then, I, I, I do have one example is, you know, I deal with a lot of church leadership within my work and stuff and, and not just in Columbia in the States as well. And, Mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll hear pastors that like, there's no problem for them to talk about how hot a woman is. Mm. But if I were to talk about how hot a man is, uh, Mm. obviously that's going to be bad. And I'm not saying that that therefore that me talking about how hot a man is should be okay. I'm talking about that. We need to be, that is just another example of how, inconsistent this comes where men christian men there's no issue for them to talk about women but yet somehow that is sinful with gay people and not only is that sinful with gay people but just if them saying i am attracted to men is just sinful and Mm -hmm. so we need to get better consistency we need to better Mm -hmm. be thinking about how do i make this equal for all people Then moving into chapter six, um, Mm -hmm. I talked Mm -hmm. a lot about community and what community looks like for for celibate gay Christians. So I would love to ask, what has community looked like for you in that way compared Mm. to what you've read there? Well, I live in the side B Mecca, the side B San Francisco, uh, Uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, And I've been community for me is super important. Like I've been building my own community here in St. Louis for almost 10 years. Like I collect people. Mm -hmm. Um, Hospitality and intentionality are both important to my own practice. Like my calendar is crazy packed. Yeah. Like I don't even know how I do everything. Like, okay. So I went to work yesterday and then I came home on the train and then I had uh, coffee with one of my board members at an arts venue that I manage. I went from there. I had a half an hour to sit and sort of decompress from that conversation. And then I had dinner with another friend that I haven't seen in forever who grew up in the church, but is angry at the church now. And so we had Mm -hmm. dinner for like an hour or two. And then a friend came over and we talked from, I don't know. We ran to a bookstore. We still have those here in St. Louis. And so we ran to a bookstore to pick up a book that I'd ordered and we talked in the car and then all the way back. And he left sometime around 11 last night. And then I went to bed and then I woke up this morning at six so that I could have breakfast at 7 AM with a friend of mine that I used to go to church with that um, I haven't seen in two years. And then now I'm here recording this with you and it's Saturday. Like, (laughs) And, and then I have, and then I have a project that I have to do for um, an unnamed orchestra here in town. And then like, I get to spend some time sort of decompressing, but like I, the, when you're building community, like this is just what, yeah. it's just the, the pace of the thing. And so like, I'm the extrovert of the group. So I end up like orchestrating people coming together a lot. And uh-huh. so like, that's just what I do. And for some people, this looks less like having a packed calendar and more just like living with people in an intentional community. Uh-huh. And that's cool. That's not what I'm looking to do because when I come home at the end of a night, like it's not that I don't ever want to live with another gay person because I have before and I enjoyed it. But like uh, right now all my roommates are straight and I enjoy just kind of coming home and just tuning out all things gay and just sitting down and enjoying one of the 275 
feature films that I have in my collection that are silent that were made you, between 1915 and 1929. Like, you don't want to deal with the gay drama once you get home? My gosh, no. I don't. No? Are you sure? Okay, maybe a little, but not, <laughs> but not as a general rule, right? You know, so... <laughs> Yeah, I just it's it's nice to just kind of and 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 like I have great roommates who don't mind that I have people over all the time and like my movie collection isn't just self serving for me like I had people over to watch the original Three Musketeers last Saturday oh and we had a fabulous time watching the silent film from 1921 and eating popcorn that I made with avocado oil on the stove and you know, enjoying a glass of wine or soda and just like, we had a great time and people were just hanging out and some of them were gay and most of them were not. And it was just like building a friend group. And like, that's the kind of, that's the kind of community building that I find myself doing a lot. And it's, it's worked like St. Louis. I'm not the only reason St. Louis is kind of a side B Mecca, but I'm one of the reasons. Yeah. I was about to say that. Because first of all, I'm fascinated by this whole thing of side St. Louis right. being like the center of where there's the most side B people in one city. Yeah. And um, hence why it got its name side B Mecca or side B San Francisco. Right. right. Um, and I, this is the irony of it all. Okay. Mm-hmm. St. Louis, side B Mecca, South Florida where I'm at, I don't know another single side B person in Southeast Florida. I know them in Florida, but not right. in Southeast Florida. How that has happened, I don't understand because of how gay Southeast Florida is. Um, <laughs> don't understand it. But yeah, so then I have, people have told me that you are one of the reasons why St. Louis has become the side B Mecca. Is there, is that just been because of you inviting friends to go live there? I've done that. Um, I would say that that's only recently started happening where people have moved here. I've been like, you should think about moving here. And then people move here. Like in the past, it's really just been that people who are living here already kind of hear about hangouts through the grapevine or there's been ministries that have been affiliated, you know, like they have been points of contact, I should say, uh, for people who are gay and celibate. And so like people meet through those ministries and then they sort of start hanging out and we start going hiking together or we hit up, um, there's the, um, there are the um, Native American burial grounds over in Cahokia across the river. And it's fun to go walk around and look at them and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And, and so like, you know, just sort of taking trips together. Like when this big side B retreat happened last year in Ohio, like we, we had, what was St. Louis's delegation, like two cars full of people who, who, mm. who drove up uh, to Cincinnati from St. Louis. And like we, I mean, we had five people in my t- 2018 Honda Fit, which that's insane. Huh. Um, we managed to get, we managed to get four gay men and one, and one bi woman into a car um, that does not hold very many more people than that. It holds no more people than that. And we managed to get all of the luggage in it. We didn't have to divide up the luggage between different cars. And, and you so all like, stayed in a car for hours and didn't kill each other? We all stayed in a car for hours and didn't kill each other. And if I went through, I won't embarrass the people who were in that car because some of them are not out generally and some of them wouldn't appreciate being named in this fashion. But let me tell you what, is anybody who knows who was in that car and how many strong opinions were in that car for however long that trip was, six hours, like would be in awe that we didn't kill each other. Um, but we didn't, we had a fabulous time and we had an Airbnb, we even got up there a day early and hit an Airbnb and stayed there the night. And we had a That's wonderful so time. It was super fun. Yeah. So Great. yeah, like it's- Well then I'm putting out a note there. Again, side beers, if you're in South Florida, connect with me. Because I need more side beers in Florida. Well, no, sorry. There are side beers in Florida. Let me clarify. There are side beers all throughout Florida. Right. Southeast Florida. Connect South with me. Florida. Josh is oh, fun. Right. He likes long walks on the beach or short walks <laughs> on the beach or any walks on the beach, really. <laughs> I just need people to talk to. No, I take right. that back. I have, people. I have friends, I promise. I do have friends. I have community. And I love all of them um, as well. But yeah. yes. So the last chapter then, just to kind of close it off, because I heard, 
a lot of people told me they felt like this was the strongest chapter of the book was just about how gay Christians could strengthen the church. Um, Mm -hmm. What did you think about the points that were brought up? Was there anything you felt like was missed or anything? I'm I'm not so sure that I would see anything as being missed specifically, but something that like, I think that gay Christians can offer the church is that like Americans hate to suffer. Like I'm just speaking to American Christians right now. Americans hate to suffer. And like, let's be honest whenever you say no to any desire you have, there's a certain amount of suffering that's built into that. It doesn't make us a martyr for turning down sex, but it's also not inconsequential, right? And there are others who deny themselves the pleasures of sex because of their understanding of sexual ethics in the Bible. So that doesn't make gay people different in that regard. Mm -hmm. But it is a high concentration of people who are gay and celibate, who are actively saying no to sex, there's a higher concentration of them in that subgroup of people than there are in, say, the subgroup of people who are straight and in a singles ministry, for example. Yes. Right? So, like, I think that being able to grieve that loss well and also be in a position to encourage others who find themselves with a similar grief of saying no to something, I think that's a profound gift that we can offer the church. We can offer the church an example of what it is to grieve and lament and also to turn our attentions toward the gospel. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's, that's the main, that's the main thing. I I think that there's, that's one of the main things that celebrate great gay Christians in our midst can tell us. Yeah, absolutely. And I love, he quotes in here, Greg Coles. Mm -hmm. uh, I love Greg. Oh my gosh, I love him. This man, if y'all don't know Greg Coles, you need to. Because I have never met anyone more joyful. No, how is anyone that joyful? I I don't don't know how. I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, Mm -hmm. So Greg, yes, I love you. Um, And text me. Uh, So with that... (laughs) I I love the quote that he has from Greg Coles that says, maybe the problem isn't that faith costs some of us too much, but that it costs all of us too little. And I I think it's true. Sometimes, so many times we talk about like gay celibates is like, Oh, it's just, it's too much sacrifice. And it's like, Mm -hmm. is it like, this is the very thing that Jesus sacrificed. Like Jesus sacrificed the possibility. I think we sometimes think of Jesus as like, not even desiring a family or a relationship, but I don't think that that's was the reality for Jesus. I think Jesus did. And Jesus sacrificed that for us. He, yeah. he did the same sacrifice that we are doing that we have the potential to go out and have a relationship, the relationship that we want. That's a choice. I can go get married, find a man, get married easily. I mean, well, not easily, but you know no, what I mean? But, right. Um, right. <laughs> have sure. to find one yeah. that wants to take me first. But, um, no. but I can't, that's a choice. And I choose right. not to. And it's the same choice right. Jesus took. And so I think so many times in American, yeah, in, in American Christianity, we make it easy for people to follow Jesus yeah. when we forget about this, the real sacrifice that is there. Well, and it's not just the sacrifice, right? So like one of the other benefits that, that, uh, that Yar House and uh, Zor- uh, Zapora. That's, I'm just, I know I'm I can't it. pronounce her name. Doctor Z. Oh so, yeah, I'm so yeah, sorry. Uh, we can't pronounce your last name. So doctors Y and Z. Okay. Um, I, like say this. A, a related benefit, and I'm on page 204. A related mm-hmm. benefit of celibate gay Christians bring to the body of Christ is that they add a missing element of diversity, one that might otherwise be overlooked. This diversity is a source of critique for some insofar as the church tends to think of itself as reflecting a single uniform way of being in the world, one race or ethnicity or specific presentation of itself that functionally applies only to those who are just like me. And then he quotes a guy named Sebastian. Um, And he says, quote, I don't think straight people hear themselves talk very often, especially conservative straight people. They have no clue. I remember growing up hearing that AIDS was a scourge on the homosexual. It was like the Old Testament comes to roost. Uh, um, it was like, they're out there, they're not in here. Of course, it's fine to talk this way instead of realizing that there are gay people in here. Even if we're like only 2 to 3% of the population, we're still in here. I like to tell my story so that 
they can hear what I hear so that they get a little bit of a taste of for the anxiety I grew up with. Mm -hmm. I also think it's good for people to hear from people who are not like them in the church, whether it's a different race or ethnicity or a different country. Yes. And like, I, I totally agree with that. Like that's, we have to be able, th this ties back into what you were saying earlier about the ability of people to, um, to have a different, perspective if they're you know if they're a straight christian versus a gay christian or if they're a married christian versus a single christian like the variety of opinion will give us a bigger view of what scripture has to say yes. and if we if we turn that down we're not going to we're not going to experience the benefit of reading scripture and community we're we're going to miss out on those other relationships we're going to miss out on what those relationships afford us in reading scripture and and worshiping together yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I do agree with that. I think the the other like way that we strengthen the church that really stood out to me and I've seen real in my life has been um being authentic and vulnerable. Yeah. Um because yeah. I'm just a very generally honest person mm -hmm. and I'm like, look, this is how I live and this is how and this is what I'm struggling with. Um I have a hard time with the Christian perfection of like, oh, Jesus is blessing me, or just kind of like the the unknown prayer request. I get why people do it. I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not tearing that down. I'm just saying it's very hard for me to to be that way. And um, what I've seen is that when I can be authentic and I can be real about what I'm struggling with or what I'm going through, it allows other people to do the same. Yep. And I think that that's not just true of gay people, but I think in general, but I think as gay people, we get to the part place of just being more honest yeah. because that's how we have to live. And many times. And so it, it allows then for others to be able to live with that same authenticity. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So altogether, costly obedience, really good. I think it's yeah. worth reading. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's totally a step forward in this conversation the church is having. Um, it's definitely it, it it's it's a must read for pastors. Yes, I like, totally and it's a must. Read, it's a, honestly it's a must read for anyone involved in ministry at all, whether they're a ministry leader or a ministry follower. Like, yeah, it's totally it's totally something that they need to be reading. Yeah, because it it really gives you um, an eye into our community that many people don't always understand. Right. And he does a good way of explaining it in a way that I feel like general Christians can then understand and get it and be like, oh, mm -hmm. this makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think it's a starting point and I think there's a lot more research and stuff to be done yeah. on, on all of this. As you said, that it just shows how much more work we all have. <laughs> Absolutely. Like I want to see a books by other researchers that validate mm -hmm. the findings in this one or, 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 or call into question the findings exactly in this book. I want to see I want to see pastors and counselors write books that address the sorts of questions that are being asked in in costly obedience. Yes. Like this is all well and good to be like, okay, here's where we are right now. But for us to fail to adjust how we're extending the grace of Christ in community to people even with this sort of information at our disposal, like it, 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 it would be a grave oversight and it would be a total mishandling of yeah. the knowledge we've been given. Well, everyone, that's it for today. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation in both episodes and that it has helped you get more clarity and get more understanding, whether you've already read the book or you have not read the book. If you haven't, I encourage you to go pick it up. It's a great read. Also, if you've read it, I want to hear your thoughts. You can send a message through the podcast social media or to lifeonsidebpodcast at gmail.com. I can't wait to hear your thoughts. Also, David Gill's contact information will be in the episode notes. And also, I want to thank Scott Holm, who is responsible for all of the music in today's episode. Thanks again to David for joining me for this entire conversation. And thanks, y'all, for listening. Bye now. <laughs>